Are you fascinated by fungi? So I'm out here on the Mendocino coast with world-renowned mycologist Alan Rockefeller. We've been having a hell of a time walking around just looking at all these different mushrooms. And what are some of the things that we've seen out here today? And those hydrosabes were really awesome. I mean, I got just like my, all my boxes totally full. I just can't make another collection. So we, yeah, we found a ton of cool mushrooms, lots of biodiversity, really exciting things that glow, exciting things that smell good, taste good, have interesting ecology. It's been a blast just being out here. Are there mushrooms like along your journey that you found particularly inspiring or like kind of totally shifted the way that you thought about things? Well, I mean, my favorite mushroom is the one that's right in front of me. Okay, that's a good answer. Is there something else that's like the UV reactions that you get with different... Get, certainly getting the best photo you possibly can is really nice. Okay. And the UV reactions are nice too. So you've had sort of a journey from your mushroom career, as it were, where you sort of started out just fascinated by a lot of things. You sort of learned as much as you could, and then you got deeper into different aspects of doing more photography, doing more microscopy, entering into sequencing as sort of ways to like deepen your understanding, basically. Yeah, I mean, the more you can figure out, the more interesting they get, right? Right. And I think that's, you've shown that time and time again to me with your macro photography, because I'm like, yeah, I know what that mushroom is. And then I see one of your photos and I'm like, holy crap, there's an entire world of texture and color and things that I wasn't even able to perceive before because I couldn't possibly get close enough. Yeah, you can definitely see things a lot better with a macro lens than you can with your eye. Yeah. And that's kind of like, it's the same, in some way, it's the same thing that you're using technology to become like a superhuman observer of mushrooms, right? That's a good way to put it. You're giving yourself superpowers being able to look in extreme detail by being able to capture textures and colors and stuff you can't actually see with your naked eye. And you're able to like somehow delve into their hidden secrets by actually sequencing them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, mushrooms are mushrooms are mushrooms, but there's so many different weird kinds of mushrooms out there. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh man, look at the size of that porcini. Oh, that is so big and floppy. That's full of bugs and all squishy, but man, that's a, that's a monster. Oh yeah, that is a very moldy wet. So I was wandering around the forest floor and I saw these little flashes of color here we have these kind of beautiful orangey wet mushrooms. These are hygrosabi. The common name for these is a witch's hat. The sort of core defining feature of these is their sap ropes are going down here, kind of mixed redwood duff. And as they age, they start turning black. And they have these nice sort of like conical cone-shaped hats. And so when they turn black, it's called a witch's hat. So you've got these, these beautiful mushrooms and you're gonna collect them for what purpose? This is for? Nordelus, who uh, wrote a lot of the Enteloma books and publishes all the Enteloma papers, he wants them. Okay. And so. so um, them for a scientist who wants to study them? Yeah, and okay. I'll, I'll probably split it between a few people that are studying Enteloma. Yeah. So you'll, and you'll do some microscopy, some sequencing? Yeah, you know, I've already have really nice spore photos, but I don't have anything of like the Pileopelis or the other microscopic features, so. Cool. I'll do that. I won't do very much microscopy unless the sequence shows that it's like a species complex or that mm -hmm. there's actually something different going on. The important thing there is like what we're defining as species is actually a human construct and we're defining things because we're trying to understand them and gain like a language to talk about them in a common way. Yeah, we need a way to talk about everything. So just uh, tell somebody what we found or if you find something like really cool, maybe some molecule that's valuable or medicinal, you need to be able to say exactly what you found that molecule in. Mm. You know, just saying that it's in some purple mushroom isn't really good right, There's a lot of purple mushrooms. You don't know which one it was, right? Yeah. So we were talking about those waxy caps and the little witch's hats and Alan's got a, just a beautiful selection of them here found kind of a little area where there's a lot of different specimens at different ages and we're just picking them up. He's going to photograph them, document them, voucher some, and then dry them and sequence them. 
And so this is really cool to use all of the tools available as a mycologist to help you look in depth at a mushroom and figure out, does this meet our expectation for what species this should be? Or is it something different that we haven't fully cataloged or understood yet? And there's a, there's a high probability that when we take the sequence of this, it will look similar to other closely related mushrooms, but have enough difference in its own sequence to be defined potentially as a new species specific here to California. So this is the one people call Hygrosibi singeri, and Hygrosibi singeri was described in the 1940s from Mount Hood um, up in Oregon. However, there's an isotype sequence of uh, Hygrosibi singeri, so we have some idea what it is. Um, but there's never been any Hygrosibis collected that has a sequence that match the isotype of Hygrosibis singeri. Hmm. So you could say that Hygrosibis singeri is super rare and just never really turns up. Or if you want to allow for a little more sequence difference, you can say, well, it's just kind of a variable species. So I think more microscopy and morphological studies need to be done compared to the sequences before we can really decide if Singerai is a good name for this, but it's certainly not a bad name for this. I saw a little flash of white just sort of in this moss. And if I dig in here, and we kind of like excavate a little bit, boom. We got these beautiful white chanterelles, Cantharellus subalpinus. Oh, just absolutely gorgeous, meaty mushroom. And they're all over this big mossy area, but you kind of have to, to dig for them. Um, so I don't want to disturb stuff too much. I'm also going to like be careful to kind of put the, the moss back where it was. But as we look around, they're just, they're all up in here, hidden away. And they're in pretty good shape because the microclimate inside the kind of mossy cover has kept them, uh, kept them really fresh. So, got one here that's a little desiccated because it was a little more revealed, you know, a little uncovered, but I'll trim that off. And uh, under here, oh, there's more, there's more good ones. So, get in here, cut a couple of these off, just clean them up. I don't need to take all of them, but we'll get we'll get the best ones. Oh yeah, and dig these out. Take a knife. Oh, that's a beautiful one. There we go, big meaty white chanterelles. This is a classic golden chanterelle. It has little ridges that run down under the cap onto the stipe. It has white flesh and it's ectomycorrhizal, so it'll be growing with particular host trees. These are really delicious edible mushrooms. They're kind of earthy, kind of fruity. They really like meaty texture. You can shred them, you can cook them almost any way, and they're just absolutely amazing. So chanterelles are highly sought after edibles, but there's a lot of look-alike mushrooms, and so I'm gonna show you some of those. This is what's called the false chanterelle, which is a terrible name, because it really looks quite different from a chanterelle, but people do get them confused because they can grow in similar habitats, although these are often growing on wood chips rather than under particular host trees. They are much more orange, uh, and they're kind of like hollow and fibrous inside of being, instead of being white and fleshy. Um, they also, the biggest feature you can see that's different is these really orange gills, and they're true gills, unlike the little blunt ridges that are on a chanterelle. Uh, so this is not a poisonous mushroom by any means, but it's not a very good edible mushroom either. So you want to be able to recognize this Hygrophoropsis arantica from a true Cantharellus chanterelle. This is the scaly chanterelle, sometimes known as a woolly chanterelle. It's Turbinellus flaccosus. It's not actually a chanterelle. It's not even related to chanterelles. It's actually related to Romeria and other gomphus mushrooms. It has these big, weird, decurrent gills, kind of wrinkly things that run down on the outside. And they're more, they're more like ridges, so sort of like a chanterelle uh, than they are like actual gills but they're bright vases of red color. And these are really cool mushrooms that are just growing all over this little grove we're in. Huge clusters like this on the ground. And they can last for quite a while because they're somewhat resistant to mold and bugs. They are inedible in the sense that they contain an organic acid that can be a toxin to us if we eat too much of it. In some places like Mexico and India, they do eat these, but I've heard that they scrape off some of this uh, pore or like gill surface kind of thing, the hymenium here. And, uh, and maybe take off some of the red parts, but you would want to be careful how much you eat because you can get sick if you eat too much of it. I've also heard it's kind of like a slightly sour flavor, so it's not really a, a choice edible by any means, and it is, it is somewhat toxic if you have too much of it. But it's really cool to just see these all over the forest floor. There's also 
this beautiful little purple pig's ear. So this is Gomphus clavatus, and it has these little decurrent ridges that run down. Sometimes they call this the purple chanterelle, but it is also not a true chanterelle. It has sort of like tan cap cover, but then this beautiful like underside, but it's really good to be able to recognize this is not a true chanterelle, it's not a purple chanterelle, it's actually this pig's ear, Gomphus clavatus. They're actually related to Romaria, these beautiful coral mushrooms, instead of being related to a chanterelle. Rhizopogon. Oh, well you say rhizopogon instead of rhizopogon? Okay. Oh yeah, you can say rhizopogon. Rhizopogon sounds so much more dramatic. Yeah, it sounds so yeah. much more epic. Rhizopogon. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> as soon as I handle it at all, it stains kind of red. Yeah, yeah, I think they say rhizopogon occidentalis nice. goes red. Okay, rhiz yeah, that's, that's definitely what this is. Eee, fun little uh, sort of truffle-like hypogeus fungi <laughs> are really important mycorrhizal associates with pine. Uh, they're super important for helping them resist stress and environmental conditions that are sort of challenging. So having lots of this mycelium in the soil means we've got a good healthy pine forest out here. Yeah, very white mycelium at the stem base. That's how you kind of tell the carriers apart. And one of the main things to look at is the stem base when it's really fresh. Love the cap texture in these. This cap is full of little tiny recurved squamules. So they're kind of pointed upwards, curving upwards. And they also have really widely spaced gills, white spores. You can kind of see the white spores collecting in some of those spots. And a really fibrous stem. You should also have a hollow stem. One of some things that people can do if they're interested as like a community science member or a citizen scientist and they want to, you know, do something in their local area, how do they can kind of start contributing? The easiest thing to do is just go out and start finding mushrooms. And when you find them, try to get the best picture you can. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you have a good collection, you know, several old ones, several mm -hmm. young ones, mm -hmm. uh, all different stages in development. Put mm -hmm. them all together into one photo and, you know, get the lighting right, just get a real nice picture. And then upload the picture to a citizen science website like Mushroom Observer or mm -hmm. iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. Uh, that way other people can see it and the photo is like available for other people to study. It makes a new distribution record. Mm -hmm. And then you should always save every mushroom you photograph. Mm. So it's, it's best to save a good collection with like various stages of development. But even saving like, you know, just one gill from every mushroom you photograph mm -hmm. would be a thousand times better than saving zero gills. Because um, with the gill, you can do microscopy and DNA sequencing. Mm -hmm. Neither of those take more than a tiny speck of material. Mm. So, um, you know, being able to save all these mushrooms uh, really helps because if you sequence them, you can figure out, oh, it's maybe a new species or a species we didn't expect to, to find here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I'll just grab like one mushroom, I'll, I'll get back home, I'll sequence it in my garage, and then I'll realize like, oh, this is definitely a new species. Mm -hmm. And then the next time I go out there, I'm on the lookout for that thing because I know like, oh, this one needs more documentation. Gotcha. So just kind of like a broad DNA sequencing of like a lot of finds can let you focus in on the, the really cool stuff. Mm. The things that need more focus and more documentation because they're not already in the record of, of sequences that are online. Yeah, especially if you do a blast. So yeah. you search GenBank for that yeah. sequence and there's no matches or only a couple poorly understood matches. You're like, wow, this one really needs more documentation. Whereas if there's 30 or 40 matches and they're from all over the world and they have really good photos to go with them, you're like, okay, that's awesome. I got this exact thing that I thought it was. But maybe it hadn't been documented in that place before. So now you're adding to the body of knowledge, even if it's fairly well understood, you now know it that happens in your backyard as well as all these other places. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing that there's a lot of this science is also being driven by amateurs because I think in most other fields, almost everything is being done by people in academia. And in mycology, I see so many people you included, who are just like, I'm in the woods documenting what I find because I think it's cool. And I'm also doing like the cutting edge of science at the same time. Yeah, it's definitely a field where it's easy to, to learn how to do cutting edge science. You know, someone with only a couple of years of experience could be discovering all sorts of new things. Right.